Blowing Bubbles by Hannah Flagg Gould, read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples, August 10, 2017, in the United States of America. Half our sorrows, half our troubles, making head and heart to ache, are the fruit of blowing bubbles, bright to view, but quick to break. All have played the child imbecile, breathing hard to swell the sides of a shining fluid vessel, frailer than the air it rides. From the infant's cradle rising, all the bubble mania show, oft our richest wealth comprising in the bubbles that we blow. Brilliant, buoyant, upward-going, pleased we mark them in their flight, every hue of iris showing as they glance along the light. Little castles, high and airy, with their crystal walls so thin, each presents the wicked fairy, vanity, enthroned within. But when two have stuck together, what of either do we find? Not so much as one gay feather flying hope has left behind. Still the world are busy, blowing every one some empty ball. So the seeds of mischief sowing, where to burst the bubbles fall, nor for self alone to gather is our evil harvest found. Oft with pipe and cup we rather step upon our neighbor's ground. Thus amusing one another, while the glistening playthings rise, we may doom a friend or brother to a life of care and sighs. Do you doubt my simple story? I can point a thousand ways, where this bubble-making glory has in darkness hid its rays. Yet we'll spare a slight confusion caused the world by giving names, since a right to some delusion every one from nature claims. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Infant Faith by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples August 10, 2017 In the United States of America Radiant with his spirit's light was the little beauteous child, sporting round a fountain bright, playing through the florets wild. Where they grow he lightly stepped, cautious not a leaf to crush. Then about the fount he leaped, shouting at its merry gush. While the sparkling waters welled, laughing as they bubbled up, in his lily hands he held closely clasped a silver cup. Now he put it forth to fill, then he bore it to the flowers, through his fingers there to spill what it held in mimic showers. Open, pretty buds, said he, open to the air and sun, so tomorrow I may see what my rain today has done. Yes, you will, you will, I know, for the drink I gave you now, burst your little cups and blow, when I'm gone and can't tell how. Oh, I wish I could but see how God's finger touches you when your sides unclasp and free let your leaves and odors through. I would watch you all the night, nor in darkness be afraid, only once to see aright how a beauteous flower is made. Now remember, I shall come in the morning from my bed, here to find among you some with your brightest colors spread. To his buds he hastened out, at the dewy morning hour, crying with a joyous shout, God has made of each a flower. Precious must the ready faith of the little children be, in the sight of him who saith, Suffer them to come to me. Answered by the smile of heaven is the infant's offering found through a cup of water given, even to the thirsty ground. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Patty Proud by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples August 10, 2017 In the United States of America The figure before you is Miss Patty Proud. Her feelings are lowry, her frown like a cloud, because proud Miss Patty can hardly endure to come near the lowly abode of the poor. She fears the plain floor of the humble will spoil her silk shoes and hose, and her skirt-bottom soil. And so she goes wincing, and holds up her dress, so high it were well if her heels would show less. 
but when she walks through the fine streets of the town she puts on fine airs and displays her rich gown till some who she passes will think of the bird renowned for gay feathers whose name you have heard in thought she is trifling in manner as vain as that silly fowl taking pride in his train and none who have marked her will need to be told that she has a heart hard and haughty and cold i saw when she met some poor children one day who asked her for alms she turned frowning away and told them poor people must work to be fed and not trouble ladies to help them to bread and just as the sad little mendicant said their mother was dying their father was dead she entered a store with a smooth smiling face to lay out her purse in gay ribbons and lace i saw her curl up her sour lip in disdain because ellen pitiful picked up the cane a feeble old man had let fall in the sand and placed it again in his tremulous hand but little does haughty miss patty suppose of all whom she visits that any one knows how stern she can look when she's out of their sight and fret at the servants if all is not right at home she's unyielding and sullen and cross her friends when she's absent esteem it no loss and some where she visits in secret confess that they love her no more though they dread her much less the truth is miss patty when young never tried to govern her temper or conquer her pride the passions unchecked in the heart of the child like weeds in a garden neglected ran wild they grew with her growth with her strength became strong her head not then righted has ever been wrong and so she would never submit to be told of faults by long habit made stubborn and bold and now among all my young friends is there one a fair little girl is there under the sun who'd rise to a woman and have it allowed that she is a likeness of miss patty proud end of poem this recording is in the public domain I Caught a Bird by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org By Alan H. Staples August 15, 2017 In the United States of America I caught a bird. She flitted by, so near my window lifted high. She softly ventured in to spy what I might be about. And then, a little wildred thing, like many a one without a wing, she fluttered, struck, and seemed to sing alas i can't get out she saw her kindred on the tree before her sporting light and free but felt a power she could not see repel and hold her back in vain her beak and breast and feet against the crystal pane were beat she could not break the clear deceit nor find her airy track the pretty wanderer then i took and felt her frame with terror shook and gave the sad and piteous look of helplessness and fear till quick i spread my hand to show i caught her but to let her go and i perhaps may never know a dearer moment here she piped a short and sweet adieu as humming on the air she threw her brilliant buoyant wing and flew away from fear and me but ere the hour of setting sun that little constant grateful one returning had her hymn begun in our old rustling tree now do not take the fatal aim my tender bird to kill or maim nor let the fatal shot proclaim her anguish or her fall but would you know the bird i mean she is the first that will be seen the last and every one between she represents them all end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Flower of Shells and Silver Wire by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples August 15, 2017 In the United States of America I sought a meet gift it might please thee to wear Among the soft locks of thy fine silken hair and asked the two deeps for some treasure or gem by nature first formed and embosomed in them 
The mine gave me threads of its fine silver ore. The ocean cast up its smooth shells to the shore. Of these I combined the free offering, that now I bring, and would set o'er thy fair peaceful brow. The shells thou wilt see are unsullied and white, the silver is modest and precious and bright, a type thy quick fancy will readily see, yet thou wilt not confess what its meaning may be. And let the gift sometimes recall to thy mind the friend by whose hand its pure parts were combined. But oftener that friend in whose hand was the skill, the earth and the seas with their treasures to fill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Little Blind Boy by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples August 15, 2017 In the United States of America O oh, tell me from the form of the soft summer air That tosses so gently the curls of my hair it breathes on my lip, and it fans my warm cheek, but gives me no answer, though often I speak. I feel it play o'er me, refreshing and light, and yet cannot touch it, because I have no sight. And music, what is it, and where does it dwell? I sink, and I mount, with its cadence and swell, while thrilled to my heart with its deep-going strain, till pleasure excessive seems turning to pain. Now what the bright colors of music may be, will any one tell me, for I cannot see. The odors of flowers that are hovering nigh, what are they? On what kind of wings do they fly? Are not they sweet angels who come to delight a poor little boy that knows nothing of sight? The sun, moon, and stars never enter my mind. Oh, tell me what light is because I am blind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of The Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights, Section 7. Footnote. From a speech as presiding officer at the Republican State Convention of Massachusetts, held in Boston, October 5, 1912. End of footnote. During the last few years, other questions have arisen far more important than any tariff or currency can possibly be, because they involve nothing less than the fundamental principles of American government. An agitation has been in progress and is now being carried on by men of both parties, whether the party division which it causes has been declared or not, which aims at, and if successful, can lead to nothing less than a complete revolution in our system of government. The scheme has now extended to the primaries, which are merely a part of the machinery of government and do not in themselves involve any constitutional principle. It has been seriously proposed in this state and I think in this state alone, to abolish party enrollment from the party primary. The proposition is a contradiction in terms. The primaries were established for the purpose of purifying and improving the methods of nominating party candidates and for no other object. Those who belong to no party are not compelled to enter them, and have no right to do so unless they intend to become members of some party for which and for which alone party primaries exist. If you abolish the party enrollment and the party ticket and put all names on one ballot, you turn primaries into a preliminary election. But at the same time, you do much more than this, for you would then have an arrangement by which organized minorities belonging to any party or to none could go into the primaries and control the nominations of all parties. 
In other words, under this system, not only Democrats, but any voters not Republicans, can decide the selection of the Republican candidates. And of course the same is true of Democratic candidates, who could be nominated by Republican or even Prohibition votes. By this scheme we are to be deprived of the right of choosing our own candidates, and the whole thing becomes a travesty on popular government. It is idle to suppose that large bodies of men who agree on certain political principles will long submit to having candidates chosen for them whose selection they cannot themselves control. My right as a citizen, and the right of those who think with me to nominate our own candidates for office, is a great and inalienable right which is not to be taken from us by any jugglery of the statutes. If Republicans are not to have the opportunity to select their own candidates, and Democrats are not to have the opportunity to select theirs, then I say that it is the duty of every responsible political party holding well-settled principles and favoring well-defined policies to select its own candidates by its own voluntary methods and place their names upon the ballot on election day by nomination papers. If the party enrollment is abolished, the primaries are worthless for the purpose for which they were established, and it will be the duty of all responsible parties to stay outside of them and nominate their candidates themselves, and then place them on the ballot under the means provided by law. I have mentioned this point because although primaries affect only the mechanism of government, this attempt so to arrange them that they will become a mere vehicle for an organized minority to control all nominations brings them at once into relation with the much more profound changes affecting fundamental principles which are now urged upon us. The agitation of which I have spoken, and which, as I have said, aims at nothing less than a complete revolution in our system of government, begins by this distortion of the primaries, and then seeks to break down representative government and make the courts subservient to the will of a majority of the voters at any given moment. The first purpose is to be accomplished by the compulsory initiative and referendum, the second by the recall of judges, and the reversal by a popular vote of judicial decisions. I am opposed to the compulsory initiative and referendum because I am in favor of government by the people and through majorities of voters, and I am opposed to and always shall resist to the utmost of my power any attempt to substitute for them government by minorities of the voters. If you will study carefully the compulsory initiative and referendum, you will find that it is nothing but a scheme to enable minorities to rule. A small minority of the voters can initiate legislation and compel the legislator to pass laws. Wherever the compulsory initiative and referendum have been adopted, this power of compulsory initiation has been conferred upon a small percentage of the voters. Remember at the outset that the voters themselves are only a small minority of the people. The total vote at the last presidential election was, in round numbers, 15 millions, and the population of the United States was 90 millions. That is, one-sixth of the people took part in the presidential election, and one-twelfth determined the result. The voters are not the people. They are merely a necessary instrument selected for the expression of the popular will. But they are not the people. They are representatives and trustees. Now it is proposed to give a small fraction of the voters, not of the people, this great power to compel the submission of laws to a popular vote, and when those laws are submitted to the popular vote, experience shows that they are almost invariably carried by a minority of the voters. Those who are interested in the passage of the law, of course, take pains to vote. A small number who are interested in the other direction vote against it and the great mass remain indifferent. In the state of Ohio last September, 42 constitutional amendments were submitted to the people. It was practically a revision of their fundamental law involving questions of the greatest moment. 
fifty per cent only of the vote of ohio for governor in nineteen o eight was cast for the amendment receiving the highest number of votes and less than forty two per cent for the amendment receiving the lowest number of votes every amendment that was adopted was carried by a third to a quarter of the voters of the state who voted for governor in nineteen o eight footnote one the details of the voting which are very instructive are given by mr c b galbraith who is secretary of the convention in an article in the new york independent for december nineteen nineteen twelve following is the vote on each of the amendments one reform in civil jury system yes three hundred forty five thousand six hundred eighty six no two hundred three thousand nine hundred fifty three two abolition of capital punishment yes two hundred fifty eight thousand seven hundred and six no three hundred and three thousand two hundred forty six three depositions by state and comment on failure of accused to testify in criminal cases yes two hundred ninety one thousand seven hundred seventeen no two hundred twenty seven thousand five hundred forty seven four suits against the state yes three hundred six thousand seven hundred sixty four no two hundred sixteen thousand six hundred thirty four five damages for wrongful death yes three hundred fifty five thousand six hundred five no one hundred ninety five thousand two hundred sixteen number six initiative and referendum yes three hundred twelve thousand five hundred ninety two no two hundred thirty one thousand three hundred and twelve seven investigations by each house of general assembly yes three hundred forty eight thousand seven hundred seventy nine no one hundred seventy five thousand three hundred thirty seven eight limiting veto power of governor yes two hundred eighty two thousand four hundred and twelve no two hundred fifty four thousand one hundred eighty six number nine mechanics and builders liens yes two hundred seventy eight thousand five hundred eighty two no two hundred forty two thousand three hundred eighty five number ten welfare of employees yes three hundred fifty three thousand five hundred eighty eight no one hundred eighty nine thousand seven hundred twenty eight number eleven workmen's compensation yes three hundred twenty one thousand five hundred fifty eight no two hundred eleven thousand seven hundred seventy two number twelve conservation of natural resources three hundred eighteen thousand one hundred ninety two no one hundred ninety one thousand eight hundred ninety three number thirteen eight hour day on public work yes three hundred thirty three thousand three hundred seven no two hundred thirty two thousand eight hundred ninety eight number fourteen removal of officials yes three hundred forty seven thousand three hundred thirty three no one hundred eighty five thousand nine hundred eighty six number fifteen regulating expert testimony in criminal trials yes three hundred thirty six thousand nine hundred eighty seven no one hundred eighty five thousand four hundred fifty eight number sixteen registering and warranting land titles yes three hundred forty six thousand three hundred seventy three no one hundred seventy one thousand eight hundred and seven number seventeen abolishing prison contract labor yes three hundred thirty three thousand thirty four no two hundred fifteen thousand two hundred and eight number eighteen limiting power of general assembly in extra sessions yes three hundred nineteen thousand one hundred no one hundred ninety two thousand one hundred and thirty number nineteen change in judicial system yes two hundred sixty four thousand nine hundred and twenty two no two hundred forty four thousand three hundred seventy five number twenty judge of court of common pleas for each county yes three hundred one thousand eight hundred ninety one 
no two hundred twenty three thousand two hundred eighty seven twenty one abolition of justices of the peace in certain cities yes two hundred sixty four thousand eight hundred thirty two no two hundred fifty two thousand nine hundred thirty six twenty two contempt proceedings and injunctions yes two hundred forty thousand eight hundred ninety six no two hundred fifty seven thousand three hundred two twenty three women's suffrage yes two hundred forty nine thousand four hundred and twenty no three hundred thirty six thousand eight hundred seventy five number twenty three women's suffrage yes two hundred forty nine thousand four hundred twenty no three hundred thirty six thousand eight hundred seventy five twenty four omitting word white yes two hundred forty two thousand seven hundred thirty five no two hundred sixty five thousand six hundred ninety three twenty five use of voting machines yes two hundred forty two thousand three hundred forty two no two hundred eighty eight thousand six hundred fifty two number twenty six primary elections yes three hundred forty nine thousand eight hundred one no one hundred eighty three thousand one hundred twelve twenty seven organization of boards of education yes two hundred ninety eight thousand four hundred sixty no two hundred thirteen thousand three hundred thirty seven number twenty eight creating office of the superintendent of public instruction to replace state commissioner of common schools yes two hundred fifty six thousand six hundred and fifteen no two hundred fifty one thousand nine hundred forty six number twenty nine to extend state board limit to fifty million dollars for intercounty wagon roads yes two hundred seventy two thousand five hundred sixty four no two hundred seventy four thousand five hundred eighty two number thirty regulating insurance yes three hundred twenty one thousand three hundred eighty eight no one hundred ninety six thousand six hundred twenty eight number thirty one abolishing board of public works yes two hundred ninety six thousand six hundred thirty five no two hundred fourteen thousand eight hundred twenty nine number thirty two taxation of state and municipal bonds inheritances incomes franchises and production of minerals yes two hundred sixty nine thousand thirty nine no two hundred forty nine thousand eight hundred sixty four number thirty three regulation of corporations and sale of personal property yes three hundred thousand four hundred sixty six no two hundred and twelve thousand seven hundred and four number thirty four double liability of stockholders and inspection of private banks yes three hundred seventy seven thousand two hundred seventy two no one hundred fifty six thousand six hundred eighty eight number thirty five regulating state printing yes three hundred nineteen thousand six hundred and twelve no one hundred ninety two thousand three hundred seventy eight number thirty six eligibility of women to certain offices yes two hundred sixty one thousand eight hundred and six no two hundred eighty four thousand three hundred seventy number thirty seven civil service yes three hundred six thousand seven hundred sixty seven no two hundred four thousand five hundred eighty number thirty eight out of door advertising yes two hundred sixty one thousand three hundred sixty one no two hundred sixty two thousand four hundred forty number thirty nine methods of submitting amendments to the constitution yes two hundred seventy one thousand eight hundred twenty seven no two hundred forty six thousand six hundred eighty seven number forty municipal home rule yes three hundred one thousand eight hundred sixty one no two hundred fifteen thousand one hundred twenty number forty one schedule of amendments yes two hundred seventy five thousand sixty two no two hundred thirteen thousand nine hundred seventy nine for license to traffic in intoxicating liquors two hundred seventy three thousand three hundred sixty one 
against license to traffic in intoxicating liquors one hundred eighty eight thousand eight hundred twenty five some recent ohio election statistics are given here for purpose of comparison the vote for governor in nineteen o eight was one million one hundred twenty five thousand fifty four in nineteen ten nine hundred thirty two thousand two hundred sixty two the highest vote cast on any amendment was five hundred eighty six thousand two hundred ninety five on women's suffrage the lowest four hundred sixty two thousand one hundred eighty six was polled on the liquor license amendment a vigorous campaign was waged for both of these it will be noted however that the aggregate vote on the latter was much lower than that given for any other proposal it stood alone at the head of the second column of the ballot and many voters evidently after following down the column to number forty one thought they had reached the end of the list and did not take notice the license proposal at the head of the next column of all questions considered the initiative and referendum was most thoroughly discussed in and out of the convention it will be noted that while the majority for this prime article of the progressive faith is large it is exceeded by that given for each of the twenty-three other proposals measures accorded a high vote in the convention were not always so popular with the electors of the state the amendment receiving the highest majority passed by the convention by only a single vote more than the lowest in the entire series while numbers twenty four and thirty six which passed the convention almost unanimously were both defeated attractive titles undoubtedly helped to increase the majorities in some instances amendment number one is brief following is the full text the right of trial by jury shall be inviolate except that in civil cases laws may be passed to authorize the rendering of a verdict by the concurrence of not less than three-fourths of the jury this amendment was given the title reform in civil jury system reform in these progressive times is particularly attractive it is a case in which a rose by any other name would not smell quite so sweet this initial word probably brought a few thousand votes to an amendment that would certainly have carried under a more appropriate title in this class should be included number ten welfare of employees it provides that laws may be passed fixing and regulating the hours of labor establishing a minimum wage and providing for the health comfort and safety and general welfare of employees in this instance also the title helped a proposal that would doubtless have carried with a more explicit designation it will be seen that eight of the forty-two proposals failed to receive the required majority the first of these is the abolition of capital punishment the old doctrine of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was promulgated effectively in the convention and before the people it was also urged that under existing law in ohio the jury may recommend mercy and thus prevent electrocution the issue was clearly defined and the result fairly represents the present sentiment of the state on this subject there are evidences however that the verdict is not final and that the time is not far distant when it will be reversed to the surprise of most of the careful observers of number twenty two providing for the regulation of contempt proceedings and the prohibition of injunctions in controversies involving the employment of labor was lost the principle embodied in this amendment has been advocated for years by organized labor women's suffrage was defeated by a decisive majority but not so large proportionally as that registered against the reform in oregon in nineteen ten on the occasion of its third submission to the electors of that state through initiative petition liquor interests were most active in opposing this amendment unfortunately the opposition to women's suffrage adversely affected number thirty six which provided for the appointment of women to certain offices in the state and its political subdivisions where interests and care of women and children are involved on the face of the returns the electors of ohio have evidently resolved thoroughly to eliminate women from participating in public affairs perhaps the greatest surprise was the result of the vote on number twenty four omitting the word white 
the constitution of eighteen fifty one which was adopted before the emancipation of the colored race limited the elective franchise to every white male citizen of the united states of the age of twenty one years the word white still remains in the constitution although it was made of no effect by the adoption of the fifteenth amendment to the constitution of the united states the amendment simply sought to make the constitution of ohio harmonize in form with the national constitution a similar amendment complicated it is true with other issues was submitted in this state in eighteen sixty seven and defeated race prejudice is evidently still strong in ohio a state that in eighteen sixty one through eighteen sixty five poured forth her blood freely to blot out an invidious distinction that is still retained in her constitution the authorization of the use of voting machines was defeated largely through the strenuous opposition to it in the city of cleveland and the apprehension in rural counties that the innovation would involve needless expense perhaps the word machines had for some a sinister suggestion that increased the unfavorable vote amendment number twenty nine best known among its friends as the good roads proposal was strongly combated in the convention and the opposition was carried to the people the heaviest vote against it was polled by the farmers of the counties that already have good roads many voters in the cities and in the country were opposed to raising the bond limit of the constitution for any purpose the last in the list of defeated amendments is number thirty eight outdoor advertising this simply sought to give the general assembly authority to regulate outdoor advertising especially billboards which often mar the beauty of cities with their unsightly displays the billboard companies fought the amendment and thoroughly circularized the state against it they succeeded in defeating it by a very narrow margin the amendments that carried without exception received their large majorities in the large cities of the state the country vote was light and conservative in a number of rural counties every amendment was voted down End of footnote constitutional amendments must be submitted to the people and always have been in the states but it is monstrous that anything less than a majority of all the voters should be able to adopt a constitutional amendment we had two constitutional amendments of no great importance submitted in this state at the last election less than two-thirds not of the voters but of those who came to the polls voted on them and although there was no substantial opposition to either yet they were put into our constitution by a vote which was less than half of the votes cast for the candidates i could go on and give you case after case of a similar character and they prove beyond a possibility of doubt that the compulsory initiative and referendum is nothing in the world but a device to permit interested and organized minorities to govern the legislature necessarily represents all the people whether voted for by all the people or not and is chosen on that understanding but the minorities of voters to which we are asked to give this power to compel the submission and the adoption of laws in the exercise of that power represent nobody but themselves this system of compulsory initiative and referendum means the conversion of legislatures into mere machines of record and the destruction of representative government representative government is the one great advance in the methods of government which has been made in modern times its growth its development its adoption in one country after another have been coincident with the advance of political freedom so much so that it has become almost synonymous with it the first care of every autocrat every dictator of every man who has seized on power for himself alone has been to break down the representative body or reduce it to a form and a ceremony it is now proposed to abandon this great advance which has been made in modern times and return to earlier and rejected forms it is done under the utterly false cry of let the people rule it is not a scheme to let the people rule that is found in the constitution of the united states it is a scheme to enable organized minorities of voters to rule and through the devices of the law get possession of the state
the other great bulwark of freedom has been the independent court until the last few years a man would almost have hesitated to have given utterance to such a truism and now it is proposed to take from the courts their independence it makes no difference to whom the court is subservient when it becomes subservient to anybody outside the courtroom whether that influence comes from the king from money or from a body of voters that court is a servile court it no longer interprets the laws but declares that to be the law which someone else wants justice from ancient times has always been figured as a beautiful woman with bandaged eyes holding with steady hand the scale in which all rights and wrongs are weighed those who now assail the courts would drag her from her high throne in the courtroom and put her on the streets to solicit support from the passions of men to which she will then become at once the victim and the toy the independent judiciary of the united states and of england too taken as a whole and allowing for all the failures and defects incident to fallible human nature has been the most potent defence and protection of the liberty of the individual man and of the rights of minorities against the oppression of majorities i cannot here to-day argue this great question in detail that would take hours instead of minutes I merely point out to you that it is now assailed and that I do not believe that representative government and judicial independence, which have been the greatest achievements of our race in its battle for political freedom, have suddenly become dangerous to popular government. Mark well that all this agitation is directed against the representative and judicial branches of the government. I find in no program any attempt to limit the executive and it is logical and inevitable that this should be the case constitutional government moves too slowly to suit some people who wish to convert it to an instrument for the quick satisfaction of their own desires and aspirations which may be either beneficial or hurtful to the people at large for this reason they would substitute for it a government which consists simply of the voters and executive go back fifty years and you find an example of a government of that sort in the third napoleon with his empire based on the plebiscite abraham lincoln declared at gettysburg that the government he was trying to preserve was a government of the people for the people and by the people and that government was the government of the united states under the constitution on october twenty two eighteen sixty two governor andrew writing to daniel henshaw in regard to the conference of loyal governors recently held at altoona said in conclusion i can but regret the tendency i observe to obtrude matters mainly personal upon the attention of the people it is the great cause of democratic constitutional representative government which is now on trial it is the same constitution now as it was then except for the war amendments and if abraham lincoln and john a andrew thought that it was a government of the people which they were giving their lives to save i do not believe that any of us need be disturbed if we find ourselves in agreement with them Lincoln also said in his first inaugural, A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations, and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments, is the only true sovereign of a free people. You observe that he says a majority under constitutional checks and limitations. He draws the distinction between government by the people and government by a majority of the voters. I have already pointed out the great gulf fixed between those two things, and the proposition which now confronts us will, if carried out, break down government by the people, which is secured by the limitations of the Constitution, and give us, bound over and helpless, to the action of a majority of the voters appearing at any given moment, voters who are a minority of the people and whose majority may be fleeting temporary or accidental it was against this precise situation that the special checks and limitations which lincoln approved were devised by the convention over which washington presided let me bring home to you just 
what i mean by asking your attention to the first ten amendments of the constitution those amendments constitute a bill of rights they have become so much a part of the life of each one of us that we think no more of them than of the air we breathe lest we forget let me recall them to you these amendments protect every man in his religion there may be only two or three gathered together but congress can make no law to touch them they are secure in their right to worship god in their own way within a few days a banner has been borne through the streets of massachusetts city bearing the demand no god no master how do you think that proposition compares with the religious freedom guaranteed to one and all by the constitution of the united states to each one of you the bill of rights assures freedom of speech into the third and fourth amendments our ancestors put the principle of coke's great declaration that the house of every man is to him his castle and fortress by securing each one of us against the quartering of soldiers and against unreasonable seizures and search warrants in article five it is provided that no man shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime except by a presentment by a grand jury nor be subject to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb for the same offence nor compelled to be a witness against himself nor deprived of life liberty or property without due process of law and no man's private property shall be taken for public use without just compensation article six secures to the accused in all criminal prosecutions a speedy and public trial by jury and he must be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation he shall have the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him and to have compulsory processes for obtaining witnesses in his favor and the assistance of counsel in his defense by article seven the right of trial by jury is secured to everyone where the value in the controversy shall exceed twenty dollars article eight provides that excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted think of what those provisions mean they defend and protect each one of us in that which is dearest to us they are the guardians of human rights for every item there set down is one of the rights of men and none other could there be a greater misfortune than to have these famous clauses weakened broken mutilated or destroyed whose rights do they protect the rights of majorities on the contrary they are the protection of the individual man and of small minorities of men against the power of majorities who are to interpret those provisions and say whether the laws passed by a majority of voters infringe or not upon these great guarantees of liberty the courts the courts alone can secure us in the rights which the constitution gives us get rid of the representative government get rid of the courts and you find yourself at the mercy of any momentary majority of the voters a minority of the people usually a minority fraction of all the voters entitled to vote your life your liberty your property are left at the discretion of a majority of the voters which may be accidental fleeting temporary without any chance for that second thought or that appeal to another tribunal which were secured to each one of us by the founders of the republic the constitution is not a law it is a declaration of principles the effort now is to turn it into a statute to be altered by the whim or the passion of the moment the constitution guards the rights of each of us no matter how humble or how poor i say to you beware how you allow any man or any men to lay their hands upon that great instrument it has been the admiration of the world we have prospered and thriven and been an example to mankind under its beneficent provisions which created a self-limited democracy something which until that day men had thought impossible of accomplishment 
do not let it be torn down for if you do all the great advance and freedom which it represents will perish and we shall return to those primitive forms of government which in ancient times and in modern times as well have oscillated between anarchy and despotism which at best only brief intermissions of true and ordered liberty End of section seven. The Silver Bird's Nest by Hannah Flagg Gould, read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples, August fifteenth, two thousand seventeen, in the United States of America. We were shown a beautiful specimen of the ingenuity of birds a few days since by Doctor Cook of this borough. It was a bird's nest made entirely of silver wires, beautifully woven together. The nest was found on a sycamore tree, on the Condorus, by Dr. Francis Beard of York County. It was the nest of a hanging bird, and the material was probably obtained from a soldier's epaulette, which it had found. Westchester Village Record, Spring of 1838 A stranded soldier's epaulette the waters cast ashore a little winged rover met and eyed it o'er and o'er the silver bright so pleased her sight on that lone idle vest she knew not why she should deny herself a silver nest the shining wire she pecked and twirled then bore it to her bow where on a flowery twig twas curled the bird can show you how but when enough of that bright stuff the cunning builder bore her house to make she would not take nor did she covet more and when the little artisan whether neither pride nor guilt had entered in her pretty plan her resting place had built with here and there a plume to spare about her own light form of these inlaid with skill she made a lining soft and warm but do you think the tender brood she fondled there and fed were prouder when they understood the sheen about their bed? Do you suppose they ever rose of higher powers possessed because they knew they peeped and grew within a silver nest? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Quaker Flower by Hannah Flagg Gould, read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples, August 15, 2017, in the United States of America. A Trifolium from the Grave of Penn I have a little Quaker flower that hath a kind of spirit power to hold me captive hour by hour in pleasant musing lost. Twas plucked for me in distant land, and by another's friendly hand, from turf where I may never stand, then yon wild ocean crossed. A modest foreigner it came, bearing a sweet but humble name, yet worthy of a glorious fame among the sons of men. For oh, the pretty stranger grew, it drank the ether and the dew and from light received its hue upon the grave of Penn. It sprang from out that hollowed ground, unclosed its eye, and smiled around, upon the verdure of the mound, where William's ashes rest, where low the dust in quiet lies of him among the good and wise, on earth so meek, and in the skies so high among the blest. And had my flower a living root, or seed wherefrom a germ might shoot, for one young plant to be the fruit of that small vital part. Fair Pennsylvania it should be, my friendly offering made to thee, set to thy father's memory on thy kind Quaker heart. But ah, my precious flower is dead, the snow-white sheet beneath its head and on its tender bosom spread shows that its life is o'er and though each floweret of the gem and every leaf is on the stem 
I cannot spare thee one of them, because there will grow no more. I therefore bid my fancy weave this simple wreath which thou'lt receive, in lieu thereof, and thence believe, my fervent wish to be, that heaven, to overflowing still, with purest bliss thy cup may fill, and guard thee safe from every ill, whilst thou rememberest me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hummingbird's Anger by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples August 15, 2017 In the United States of America Small as the hummingbird is, it has great courage and violent passions. If it finds a flower that has been deprived of its honey, it will pluck it off, throw it on the ground, and sometimes tear it to pieces. Buffin on light little wings as the hummingbirds fly, With plumes many-hued as the bow of the sky, Suspended in ether they shine in the light, As jewels of nature, high-finished and bright. Their delicate forms are so buoyant and small, They hang o'er the flowers as too airy to fall. Unborn on their beautiful pinions, That seem like glittering vapor or parts of a dream, the hummingbird feeds upon honey, and so, of course, it is a sweet little creature, you know. But sweet little creatures have sometimes, they say, a great deal that's bitter or sour to betray. And often the hummingbird's delicate breast is found of a very high temper possessed. Such essence of anger within it is pent, t'would burst did no safety valve give it a vent. Displeased it will seem a bright vial of wrath, Uncorked by its heat the offender to scath. And taking occasion to let off its ire, It is startling to witness how high it will fire. A hummingbird once o'er a trumpet flower hung, And darted that sharp little member at the tongue. At once through the tube to its cell for the sweet, It felt at the bottom most certain to meet. But finding that some other child of the air To rifle the store had already been there, And no drop of honey for her to draw up, Her vengeance was poured on the destitute cup. She flew in a passion that heightened her power, And cuffing and shaking the innocent flower, Its tender corolla, in shred after shred, She hastily stripped, then she snapped off its head. A delicate ruin on earth as it lay, that bright little fury went humming away, With gossamer softness and fair to the eye, Like some living brilliant just dropped from the sky. And since when that curious bird I behold, Arrayed in rich colors and dusted with gold, I cannot but think of the wrath and the spite She has in reserve, though they are kept out of sight. These two-footed, beautiful, passionate things, If plumeless or plumy, without or with wings, should go to the glass or the painter and sit, when anger is just at the height of its fit. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sabbath by Hannah Flagg Gould Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jude Day of days, the dearest best, Hallowed by Jehovah's rest, when his six days' work was done, holy rose the seventh sun, when creation's pillars stood, and the Lord pronounced them good. Morning stars together sang, heaven with Sabbath praises rang, earth in pristine beauty shone, like a gem before his throne, while he marked thee as his claim. And he sealed thee with his name. Choice of God, thou blessed day, At thy dawn the grave gave way To the power of him within, Who had sinless bled for sin. Thine the radiance to illume, First for man the dismal tomb, 
when its bars their weakness owned, their revealing death dethroned. Then the sun of righteousness rose a darkened world to bless, bringing up from mortal night immorality and light. Day of glory, day of power, sacred be thine every hour, emblem earnest of the rest that remaineth for the blessed. When at last it shall appear how they loved and kept thee here to a temple in the skies, there eternal they shall rise. Not a sigh of grief or care shall mingle with their praises there then their sweet reward shall be an eternity of thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain the departing spirit by hannah flagg gould recorded for LibriVox.org by jude hush let the sigh in escaping be stopped be the dim chamber all silently trod. Let not the tear that is rounded be dropped. Oh, tis a spirit returning to God. Angels are softly untwining the strings, losing its ties to the beautiful clay. Lo, they have lifted their hovering wings. Joyous they waft her in triumphant away. Sorrow! not now o'er the spiritless form while on its features death's lilies unfold break not the heart for another so warm stopped in its pulse by a finger so cold time near shall whiten a lock of that hair silken and full round to the forehead that shines age shall not come nor the finger of care marking that brow with their deep going lines near will those lips be unsealed by the sigh anguish will never that bosom invade tears roll no more from that calm sleeping eye peace o'er the clay her smooth mantle has laid plant a young flower in beauty to spread tender and pure where the dust shall repose look then from earth whence the bright spirit fled up where to gladness and glory it rose end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet by hannah flagg gould Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jude. Spare, ruthless, fouler spare, that harmless robin's breast. Its downy vesture do not tear, but leave the lifeblood circling there, again to warm her nest. For she is hastening home with food, provided for her callow brood her tender offspring see were now thy shot to fly left as thy helpless babe would be reft of their mother and of thee to moan and pine and die then let her pass unhurt along and she will thank thee with a song end of poem this recording is in the public domain Father Here by Hannah Flagg Gold, read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Parsons. Thou whose power assumes the form now of this wild wintry storm, let it still in mercy be shown upon the raging sea. O oh, for him who tosses there, Father, hear this midnight prayer. Solemn darkness shrouds the world while with mighty wings unfurled thus the winds in fury sweep o'er the land and o'er the deep thou whose thought from death can save 
Guard the life that's on the wave. Cold and dreary is the night. Snow clouds wrap the beacon light. Rocks and ices like a host, armed for battle, bar the coast. For the coming bark appear. Guide her, save her. Father, hear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Way Song by Hannah Flagg Gold Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Parsons I'm bound to the house of my father. O oh, draw not my feet from the way, nor stop me these wild flowers together. They droop at my touch and decay. I think of the flowers that are blooming, in beauty unfading above, the wings of the angels perfuming, who fly down on errands of love. Of earth's shallow waters the drinking is powerless my thirst to allay. Their taste is of tears while we're sinking, beside them where quicksands betray. I long from that fount ever living that flows from my father's own door, with waters so sweet and life-giving to drink and to thirst nevermore. The gold of his bright, happy dwelling makes all lower gold to look dim. Its treasures, all treasures excelling, shine forth to allure me to him. The pearls of this world while I'm treading in dust where as pebbles they lie, I seek the rich pearl that is shedding its luster so pure from on high. For pains my torn spirit is feeling, no balsam from earth it receives. I go to the tree that hath healing to drop on my wounds from its leaves. A child that is weary with roaming, returning in gladness to see, a home and a parent I'm coming. My father, I hasten to thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Rising Monument by Hannah Flagg Gold Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Parsons Rise in thy solemn grandeur, calm and slow, as well befits thy purpose and thy place. Great speaker, rise not suddenly to show the earth forever sacred at thy base. Strong as the rocky framework of the globe, Proportioned fair in altitude sublime, With freedom's glory round thee as a robe. Rise gently, then defy the power of time. To future ages from thy lofty sight, Speak in thy mighty eloquence and tell That where thou art on Bunker's hallowed height, Our Warren and his valiant brethren fell. Say it was here the vital current flowed, Purpling the turf amid the mortal strife For man's great birthright From the breasts that glowed With love of country more than love of life. Thou hast thy growth of blood That gushing warm From patriot bosoms set their spirits free, all who behold shall venerate thy form and bow before thy genius, liberty. Here fell the hero and his brave compeers who fought and died to break a people's chain. The place is sacred to Columbia's tears poured o'er the victims for a nation slain. Yet from her starry brow a glory streams, Turning to gems those holy drops of grief, As after evening showers the morn's clear beams Show diamonds hung on grass and flower and leaf, Upright and firm as were the patriot souls That from thy native spot arose to God, Stand thou and hold, long as our planet rolls, This last high place by freedom's martyrs trod. Let thy majestic shadow walk the ground, 
calm as the sun and constant as his light and by the moon amid the dews be found the sentinel who guards it through the night and may the air around thee ever be to heaven-born liberty as vital breath but like the breeze that sweeps the upas tree to bondage and oppression certain death a beauteous prospect spreads for thy survey city and dome and spire look up to thee the solemn forest and the mountains gray stand distant to salute thy majesty an ocean in his numbers deep and strong while the bright shore beneath thy ken he laves will sing to thee an everlasting song of freedom with his never conquered waves rise then and stand unshaken till the skies above thee are about to pass away but when the dead around thee are to rise melt in the burning splendors of the day for then will he whose right it is to reign who hath on earth a kingdom pure to save come with his angels calling up the slain to freedom and annihilate the grave and a poem this recording is in the public domain a name in the sand by hannah flagg gould read for libivox dot org by elizabeth parsons alone i walked the ocean strand a pearly shell was in my hand i stooped and wrote upon the sand my name the year the day as onward from the spot I passed, One lingering look behind I cast. A wave came rolling high and fast, And washed my lines away. And so methought, till will shortly be, With every mark on earth from me, A wave of dark oblivion sea Will sweep across the place, Where I have trod the sandy shore, Of time and been to be no more of me my day the name i bore to leave nor track nor trace and yet with him who counts the sands and holds the waters in his hands i know a lasting record stands inscribed against my name of all this mortal part has wrought of all this thinking soul has thought and from these fleeting moments caught for glory or for shame and a poem this recording is in the public domain the child of a year and a day by hannah flag gold read for lipervox dot org by elizabeth parsons to grief the night hours keeping a mournful mother lay upon her pillow weeping her babe had passed away when she had clasped her treasure a year and yet a day of time twas all its measure twas gone like morning's ray the jewel heaven had shown her of worth surpassing gold was lent her by its owner twas never earth's to hold then fondly hovering o'er her a bright young angel hung and warm the love it bore her and sweet the song it sung o oh mother why this weeping let all thy sorrow cease my infant form is sleeping where naught can break its peace and he who once was blessing such little children here, my spirit now possessing, will hold me ever dear. I never knew the dreading of death's all-conquering blow, my mortal raiment shedding, I rose above the foe. Where sickness cannot pain me, where comes nor grief nor night, where sin shall never stain me, I dwell 
a child of light. While many a pilgrim hoary treads long earth's weary way, I have eternal glory for one short year and day. Yet that sweet angel singing its mother could not hear, for grief her heart was ringing, she'd but a mortal ear. She could not see the beaming of his celestial crown, for fast her tears were streaming, her soul to dust bow down. A voice from heaven then falling, in soothing tones to her, as of a father calling, revealed the comforter, and lifting up her lowly and sorrow-laden eye, she saw the king all holy upon the throne most high, where shining hosts were pouring their praises forth to him. She saw her child adoring amid the seraphim. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Believer's Mountains by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Parsons Not to the mount where fire and smoke Jehovah's face concealed When loud to wandering man he spoke To make his law revealed Not to the awful splendor there Can turn my fearful eye To hear its thunderings and to dare its lightnings were to die. Not on the mount where Moses stood, the promised land to see, across the waves of Jordan's flood, is yet the place for me. My spirit could not bear to take that fair and glorious view, nor dare her wondrous launch to make, to try the waters through. Not to the mount where Christ appeared, at once so heavenly bright, while they who heard the Father feared and fell before the light. Not there, my Savior ever nigh, do I his footsteps trace, his closer followers far than I attain that higher place. But to the mount without a name, where Jesus sat and taught, I daily would assert my claim to share the bread he brought. His words before that multitude dropped to his chosen few are manna for my morning food, my soul's sweet evening dew. If to temptation's mount I go, that mount exceeding high, my Lord, again rebuke our foe, and bid the tempter fly. No kingdom may I seek but thine, and let my glory be, a light reflected pure from thine, my portion life with thee. Oft to the mount of midnight shade, of solitude and prayer, ascend my soul, be not afraid, thy guide to follow there the height and stillness of the scene when thou that path has trod forbids this world to rush between a spirit and her god the mount whereon my saviour stood and o'er the city wept where fell his woe wrung drops of blood while his disciples slept there may i go yet not to sleep till Jesus be betrayed, but as he went to pray and weep, or the suffering sin hath made. And to the solemn, shuddering mount, where Christ received the cup of death to offer us a fount of life must I go up. And I must look upon his woe on that empurpled tree, to learn how vast a debt I owe by what he paid for me. Thence to the Mount of Galilee may I the way pursue, with joy my risen Lord to see, ere he ascends from view. 
for lo the heavens their gates unfold to take their coming king his angels harp on strings of gold and alleluia sing now on mount zion may i seek my shield my strong high tower and thence though here so dark and weak be clothed with light and power then at that holy mountain's top my soul no more to roam unfurl thy wings thine ashes drop and gain thy glorious home and a poem this recording is in the public domain the night and the morning by hannah flagg gould read for libivox dot org by elizabeth parsons a solemn night is o'er jerusalem nature astonished shrouds herself in gloom for he who was the babe of bethlehem is now a victim slain and in the tomb the blood which started with the agony that in the garden forced his swelling veins in crimson streams has poured on calvary a rocky cavern holds his pale remains he walked with men serene in holiness the meek the merciful through taunts and strife the front of pride he met with lowliness and bowed to death to lift his foes to life fast as their sins grew bold and multiplied his bitter cup was filling to the brim here doth he lie the pale the crucified with damps and shadows gathered over him the dismal night moves on but heavily while they who came the sepulchre to keep with bristling spears the roman soldiery would fain resign their glittering arms for sleep yet they must wake or die the sentinel must keep his constant vigils round the spot where he shall find the watch of israel the life the spirit moves and heeds him not within the grave that power victorious o'er death and darkness far from mortal sight hath wrought the body bright and glorious for resurrection by the morning light and lo the shades of night are vanishing the guard behold as comes the dawning day her dubious gloom and dimness banishing the stone that barred the tomb is rolled away but where's the form that in the drapery which wraps the dead lay spiritless and cold within the vault so still and shadowy that as a prison guard they came to hold that form is gone its cast-off covering the sad habiliments of death are here with burial odors round them hovering and white-robed angels calmly sitting near but see the garden fair and flowering where new-born lilies worship from their stalks and boughs with blossoms bend embowering the dewy pathway there the saviour walks the guilty city still is slumbering while he is risen from the broken tomb as one his vines and fruit trees numbering he breathes the incense of their opening bloom the moon now fading in the occident is not so mild so heavenly fair as he the sun just rising in the orient hath less of glory than in him we see nature that for his death and burial hath put on darkness as a morning weed arrayed in light as for a festival proclaims afar the lord is risen indeed and a poem this recording is in the public domain I shall be satisfied by Hannah Flagg Gould. 
read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. May I in thy likeness, my Saviour, awake, and rise in fair image of thee. Then I shall be satisfied when I can break this prison of clay and be free. Can I but come forth in eternity's light, with thy perfect features to shine, in raiment unsullied from time's dreary night, what honor and joy will be mine? Yes, I shall be satisfied then to have cast the shadows of nature all by, when darkness and dust from the dull eyelid past my soul sees with full opened eye. How fain would I know the great morn drawing near, when earth's dreamy visions shall fade, if I in thy semblance indeed may appear, and stand in thy beauty arrayed. To see thee in glory, O Lord, as thou art, from this mortal perishing clay my spirit immortal in peace would depart, and joyous mount up her bright way. When on thine own image in me thou hast smiled, in thy holy mansion, and when thy fatherly arms have encircled thy child, I shall be satisfied then. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Penitential Tear by Hannah Flagg Gould. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Thou trembling, pure, and holy thing, what skill from ocean's depths can bring, or toil from out the mine? What monarch in his diadem, or glittering garb, produce a gem whose brightness equals thine? Thy source is deeper than the caves of riven rock, or opening waves, invisible as air. And though the angel throng above behold thee with delight and love, they ne'er can have thee there, nor change, nor age thy sheen condemn. Thou art now unstained as when with him who dared in olden time thrice his dear suffering Lord deny, then melted at the Saviour's eye and paid thee for his crime. Called from the treasures of the soul by power divine, when thou dost roll forth from the mourner's eye, thy wearer thou dost then proclaim the heir of life who has his name writ in the book on high. Thou art a pearl that all may own, and when thy matchless worth is known to those who wear thee here, they will be changed, and shall behold the shining gates of heaven unfold, bright penitential tear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Teachings of God by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson He reigns on high, a glorious king, in ocean, earth, and air. He moves and governs everything, for God is everywhere. The waters at his bidding flow, the mountain and its flower, their majesty and beauty show as traces of his power. The lilies by the meadow rills are leaning on his hand, and so the cedar of the hills, the palm, and olive stand. He formed the birds that sport along on light and brilliant wing. He tuned them with the voice of song and joy his praise to sing. The earth is ours, so rich and fair, from him who made it thus, who sends his angels down with care to minister to us. The rainbow with its beauteous dyes, a pledge to man, is lent by him who spreads the shining skies around him as a tent. The heavens, my child, are full of him. Yon radiant sun above is but an image, cold and dim, of his great power and love. He placed that glorious orb on high in splendor there to roll, to warm the world, to light the eye. He lights and warms the soul. And lest the night with sable shade that azure vault should mar, he moved his finger there and made at every touch a star. With these the moon, his beaming gift, here lets her luster fall our thoughts to win, our hearts to lift to him who gave them all. And he is ours, that Holy One, our Father, guide, and friend, in ways untraveled by the sun, in love that ne'er shall end. Tis sweet to worship him below with his approving eye, to mark the way, 
our spirits go to seek his face on high. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Herald's Cry in the Desert by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples September 6, 2017 In the United States of America He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. St. John, Chapter 1, Verse 8 Awake, O ye nations, and shaking the slumber of death from your eyes, behold, the fair morn in its breaking, the sun of all glory arise. He comes, mist and dimness dispelling, the shadows and clouds flee away. Ho, all that in darkness are dwelling, spring up and rejoice in the day. Ye dying, life's waters revealing, he'll show you to fountain and streams. Ye wounded, for you he brings healing, come out and repose in his beams. Come, all ye disconsolate, hailing your king in his beauty and might. His raiment, Mount Ebal, is veiling, Mount Gerizim shines with his light. O oh, praise him, ye weary, in wonder, to feel your hard burdens unbound. Ye captivates, your bars fall asunder, with shoutings leap forth at the sound. Your names on his breastplate he's wearing, they're set as the seal of his ring. Ye nations, your highways preparing, receive and be glad for your king. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our Father's Well by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples September 6, 2017 in the United States of America. Come, let's go back, my brother, and by our father's well sit down beside each other, life's little dreams to tell. For there we played together in childhood's sunny hours, before life's stormy weather had killed its morning flowers. And since no draught we've tasted its weary journey through, as we so far have hasted, like that our father drew. I feel as at a mountain I cannot pass nor climb, till from that distant fountain I drink as in my prime. My spirit's longing, thirsting, no waters else can quell. My heart seems near to bursting to reach that good old well. Though all be changed around it, and though so changed are we, just where our father found it that pure well spring will be. In earth, when deeply going, he reached and smote the rock. He set its fount to flowing, it opened at his knock. The way he smoothed and stoned it, a close round shadowy cell. Whoever since has owned it, it is our father's well. His prattling son and daughter, with each an infant's cup, he waited for the water, his steady hand drew up. When he had paused and listened till down the bucket dashed, oh, how it, rising, glistened, and to the sunlight flashed. And since that moment, never has that cool deep been dry. Its fount is living ever, while man and seasons die. Around its mouth is growing the moss of many a year, but from its heart is flowing the water sweet and clear. Fond memory near it lingers, and like a happy child, she plucks with busy fingers and wreathes the roses wild. Yet many a lip, whose burning its limpid drops allayed, has since to ashes turning been veiled in silent shade. Still, we are here and telling about our infant play, where that free spring is welling, so true and far away. But oh, the change, my brother, our father's head is hoar, the tender name of mother is ours to call no more. And now around thee gather such little ones as we, were then beside our father, and look to theirs in thee. While fast our years are wasting, their numbers none can tell, so let us hence be hasting 
to find our father's well. Come, we will speed us thither, and from its mossy brink, to flowers that ne'er shall wither, look up to heaven and drink. They spring beside the waters, our father there will give, to all his sons and daughters, where they shall drink and live. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mother's Dream by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples September 11, 2017 In the United States of America And I will give him the morning star Revelations, Book 2, Verse 28 Methought once more to my wishful eye My beautiful boy had come My sorrow was gone, my cheek was dry and gladness around my home. I saw the form of my dear lost child, all kindled with life he came. And he spake in his own sweet voice and smiled as soon as I called his name. The garb he wore looked heavenly white as the feathery snow comes down, and warm as it shone in the softened light that fell from his dazzling crown. His eye was bright with a joy serene, his cheek with a deathless bloom that only the eye of my soul hath seen when looking beyond the tomb. The odors of flowers from the thornless land where we deem that our blessed ones are seemed born in his skirts and his soft right hand was holding a radiant star. His feet unshod looked tender and fair as the lily's opening bell half veiled in a cloud of glory as there around him in folds it fell. I asked him how he was clothed anew, who circled his head with light, and whence he returned to meet my view, so calm and heavenly bright. I asked him where he had been so long, away from his mother's care, again to sing me his infant song, and to kneel by my side in prayer. He said, Sweet mother, the song I sing is not for an earthly ear, I touched the harp with a golden string for the hosts of heaven to hear. It was but a gently fleeting breath that severed thy child from thee. The fearful shadow in time called death hath ministered life to me. My voice in an angel choir I lift, and high are the notes we raise. I hold the sign of a priceless gift and the giver who hath our praise. The bright and the morning star is he who bringeth eternal day. And mother, he giveth himself to thee, to lighten thine earthly way. The race is short to a peaceful goal, and he is never afar. Who saith of the wise, untiring soul, I will give him the morning star? Thy measure of care for me was filled, and pure to its crystal top. For faith with a steady eye distilled and numbered every drop. While thou wast teaching my lips to move and my heart to rise in prayer, I learned the way to a world above, the home of thy child is there. The secret prayers thou didst make for me, that only thy God hath known, arose like sweet incense, holy and free, and gathered around his throne. My robe was filled with the perfume sweet to shed upon the world's air, as I joyful knelt at my Saviour's feet, for the glorious crown I wear. In that bright, blissful world of ours, the waters of life I drink. Behold my feet as they've pressed the flowers that grow by the fountain's brink. No thorn is hidden to wound me there. There's nothing of chill or blight or sighing to blend with the balmy air. No sorrow, no pain, no night. No parting, I asked with a burst of joy. And the lovely illusion broke. My rapture had banished my beauteous boy to a shadowy void I spoke. But oh, that star of the morn still beams with light to direct my feet, where, when I have done with my earthly dreams, the mother and child may meet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The War Spirit on Bunker's Height by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples September 11, 2017 
in the United States of America. The sun walked the skies in the splendor of June, o'er earth full of promise and air full of tune. The broad azure streams calmly rolled to the deep, whose waves on its breast stirred like babies in their sleep. The turf heaved its green to the white vestured flock that fed or reposed in the shade of the rock. The birds sang their songs by their nests in the bowers, and the bee hummed with sweets from the fresh opened flowers. The humming bird glittered and whirred o'er the cell, where her nectar was stored from the hill to the dell. Mid the bloom and the perfume that passed on the breeze, from the rose and the vine and the fruit-bearing trees, it seemed like a gala when nature arrayed in festival robes with her treasures displayed reflected the smile of her maker above and offered up hymns of her thanksgiving love and yet in the bosom of man there were fires fierce quenchless and fearful consuming desires for right unpossessed and for lawless domain that burned to the soul and that flamed to the brain in the streets there was clanging and gleaming of arms in the dwellings resolve preparation alarms in the eye of the wife mother sister a tear in the face of their soldier no semblance of fear the patriot chieftain had marked out his ground to hold or to fall if his foe passed the bound and now was the hero to close in the strife for death as a bondman or freedom with life the war spirit hovered and frowned on the height, his eye flashing lightning, his wings shedding night. From his wide fiery nostrils rolled volumes of smoke, and the rocks roared afar as in thunder he spoke. At his dread shock of nature, the lamb from its play, the bee and the bird in a fright fled away. The branch, flower, and grass felt the crush and the scath and the winds passing by snuffed the heat from his wrath. With blood that in torrents he poured down like rain, he drenched the green turf that he strewed with the slain, till the eminence groaned with the carnage it bore, and its heart heaved and shuddered at drinking the gore. While the breath of the war spirit scented the air, the rivers looked wild and reflecting his glare, and ocean's cold bosom was torn as he gave the flap of his pinion to trouble its wave. The village besieged, wrapped in flames from his breath, looked up to the hill where he reveled with death, and swelled with the essence of life he had shed to sweeten their cup and the banquet to spread. O war spirit, war spirit, when didst thou bring such trophies of beauty before the pale king? since walking on Gilboa's height in thy power of Israel's valiant to mow down the flower. Mourn, wail, O ye people, and spread wide the pall, whose deep sable fringe down the hillsides shall fall. Your brethren's warm blood cries aloud from the ground that hosts like Philistia's in triumph surround. The love, the pleasant, have perished, alas, where they fell, may there hence be no dew on the grass. Let a monument there, toward the heavens, rear its head, from a base that shall cover the spot where they bled. Ah, war spirit, war spirit, deep was the gloom, though heaven was unclouded and earth all in bloom. When thou at the onset, that young summer's day, did strike so much valor to darkness away, and yet by that thunder the land is awake. T'was the crack of her yoke when beginning to break. And out of that gloom is her glory to spread, her living be franchised, immortal her dead. For up from that summit an eagle shall rise, to breast the thick clouds till he sails the blue skies, and drop while he battles at the fountain of light a plume from his pinion, their story to write, it shall fall where they fell, on the still purple sword, 
full and warm of the sunbeams their deeds to record and move o'er the scroll in the hand of the free while the wing where it grew spans the earth and the sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain the inner self by hannah flagg gould read for LibriVox.org by alan h staples september 11 2017 in the united states of america while others lie composed in sleep clothes wrapped in shade and silence deep and starry hosts and angels keep their vigils o'er the night i have a curious work to do a secret door to venture through a wondrous being then to view if i can stand the sight i now take up the sacred key unlock my breast and pass to see the inmost true essential me and lo i here have found enclosed within its shrine the heart myself my thinking reasoning part but say my spirit what thou art and whence and whither bound tis but with wonder reverence fear and shrinking that i thus draw near the majesty that meets me here my soul unveiled in thee i cannot give thy form or hue or measure or proportions true but feel myself myself subdue thou deepening mystery not all the earth nor air nor sea could furnish food to nourish thee nor welling founts nor rivers free the spirit's thirst allay nor silver web nor cloth of gold nor stuffs that time can e'er unfold nor pearls nor gems this world may hold compose thee in array yet all the fibres of my frame own that form thee their feeling came and at the slightest touch will claim thy closest sympathy thou art their life their light their spring informing them in everything but how they are allied and cling my nobler self to thee and do i thus the power survey whom all my meaner powers obey hand foot and tongue and eye are they the servants of thy will and when they pause repose to take dost thou untiring and awake thy pinions spread and swiftly make thy wide excursions still what art thou never slumbering soul to stretch thy wings from pole to pole to span the globe to mark its roll in elements to see conspiring thus to prophecy its end to come before thine eye whilst thou canst fire and flood defy nor ever cease to be and swifter than an eagle flies or arrows dart dost thou arise through air and space and scale the skies mid shining spheres to roam and with thy conscious rank elate dost stand and watch at heaven's bright gate for glimpses of that rich estate where thou mayest claim thy home thence near the pit dost thou go down to spy the difference twixt the crown of life and that dread withering frown which blights a spirit there then on eternity's dark brink between them dost thou pause and think and ask if thou shalt soar or sink to joy or woe the air too blind to trace thy being's plan too small my nobler part to span i end my quest where it began and from myself retire i hence must own within my breast a power of unknown powers possessed a flame not long to be repressed of clear immortal fire end of poem this recording is in the public domain Time by Hannah Flagg Gould, read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples, September 11, 2017, in the United States of America. Time, with thy kind and never wearying powers, give whatever we fondly count as ours life, love, hope, faith, the sun, the stars, and flowers, all that to man is dear to thee we owe yet does he call thee slayer robber thief and stern as of his foes thou wert the chief filling his path with ruins pain and grief without one tender blessing to bestow nature we laud when thou paternal time hast given maturity as well as prime 
to all her works in every age and clime since the first floret on her bosom grew light from the darkness doth thy hand unfold beauty from dust we in thy deeds behold the frail the dimmed the withered worn and old thy breath dissolves that they may shine anew the city flames and melts the tottering wall again she rises fairer for the fall thou beckonest back the flood and at thy call from crust-capped mounts volcanic splendors pour the absent sun his way to morning bends the waning star to thy command attends fills out and burns and man to dust descends in hope to live when thou shalt be no more the leaves are scattered yet the waiting tree shall have them brought in verdure back to thee the flower has vanished but the trusting bee will find her cell again with sweetness stored the seed may perish yet the germ will rise the grain is ripened while its sheathing dies the fruits of earth the glories of the skies forth by thy bounteous hand to man are poured we owe thee still for gifts far more divine the key to joys it never can be thine to give or take and heavenly light to shine when we must enter that dark shadowy veil where naught of earth the pathway can illume or lend one ray to shoot across the gloom that gathers round the threshold of the tomb when thou must there first and forever fail then why does man so oft forget that he owes all he is and all he hopes to be when thou and he are served but to thee why does he slay thee piecemeal day by day shut out an exile from thine empire there in that unknown dread boundless country where is no retreat no inn how will he bear to have thy spectre haunt the endless way man's wisest study is to know thy worth and his relations to thee from his birth to bring his course o'er this uneven earth in a clear sunset to a quiet close then as a weary traveller is undressed while gently thou the spirit mayest divest of her worn garment there remains a rest and she goes franchised to that blessed repose and now o time as one more hasty year of thine is gone thou hast another here grateful we hail it through the bitter tear may have put out the light of joy that shone on many a face though tender sundered ties have changed to chords that vibrate but with sighs in many a stricken breast where sorrow lies draining the life stream while that year has flown countless the blessings showered in its flight in seeming evils turning and viewed aright may prove but passing clouds and lined with light our trust deceived in earthly things may teach the restless eager spirit to forego her crushing grasp on hollow hopes that grow like fragile reeds to mock her hold below and after higher holier joys to reach time then our nobler aspirations raise since few and short and fleeting are our days and since so peaceful are her pleasant ways teach us to wisdom to apply the heart so that when thou hast safely led us through thy kingdom with a brighter land in view calm at thy burn and with a kind adieu we may as friends shake hands with thee and part end of poem this recording is in the public domain. My Head by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples September 11, 2017 In the United States of America The day is come I never thought to see Strange revelations of my farm and me. Dryden's Virgil My head! My head! The day is come I never, never thought to see, when all, with fingers and a thumb, may to thy chambers have a key. That is, if thou wouldst but submit to come beneath the learned touch, and let thy judge in judgment sit upon thy bumps that prove so much. I used to think our heads might let their own contents at will be shown. I never thought mankind could get an outward way to make them known. But now the sapient hand has cut the matter short, and all may tell thy value as they'd prize a nut, and know the kernel by the shell. If half the light that has been thrown on heads were only poured within, thou wouldst not thus be left to own the darkness that is now thy sin. But while the world is in a blaze of purely phrenologic light, thou wildered thing art in a maze, 
and destitute of faith and sight. They use a thousand meaning words thou couldst not utter or define, of which, to tell the truth, three words were gravel in a mouth like mine. They hold me out an empty skull to show the powers of living brains. Tis just like feeling of the whole to tell what goods the ship contains. And whether nature or mishap have raised the bump, tis all the same, the sage's crown or dunce's cap must be awarded as its claim. This hobby that so many sit and manage with such ease and grace I dare not try with rein or bit. It seems so of the donkey race. And yet, my head, no doubt, tis all a fault of thine, a want of sight, that so much said by Combe and Gall, and Spurzheim cannot turn thee right. I know not what thy case may be, if thou art hollow or opaque, I only know thou canst not see, and faith declines one step to take. This burst of light has turned thee numb, depriving thee of every sense, so now, if tired, thou must be dumb, nor say one word in self-defense, End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wheatfield by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples October 5th, 2017 In the United States of America Field of wheat, so full and fair, Shining with thy sunny hair, Lightly weaving either way, graceful as the breezes play. Looking like a summer sea, how I love to gaze at thee! Pleasant art thou to the sight, and to thought a rich delight. Then thy voice is music sweet, softly sighing, field of wheat, pointing upward to the sky, rising straight and aiming high. Every stalk is seen to shoot as an arrow from the root. Like a well-trained company, all in uniform agree. From the footing to the ear, all in order strict appear. Marshaled by a skillful hand, all together bow or stand, still within the proper bound, none oversteps the given ground, with its tribute held to pay, at his nod whom they obey, each the gems that studs its crown, will ere long for man lay down. Thou will promise art replete, of the precious sheaves of wheat. How thy strength in weakness lies, not a robber bird that flies, finds support whereby to put on a stalk her lawless foot. Not a predatory beak plunges down thy stores to seek, where the guard of silver spears keeps the fruit and decks the ears. No vain insect that could do harm to thee dares venture through such an armory, or eat off the sheath to take the wheat. What a study do we find, open here for eye and mind? In it who can offer less than to wonder and confess that on this high-favored ground faith is blessed and hope is crowned? Charity her arms may spread, wide from it with gifts of bread. Wisdom, power, and goodness meet in the bounteous field of wheat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Little Traveler by Hannah Flagg Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Alan H. Staples October 5th, 2017 In the United States of America I am the tiniest child of earth, but still I would like to be known to fame. Though next to nothing I had my birth, and lowest of all is my lowly name, yet if so humble my native place, I this can say in family pride, that I'm of the world's most numerous race, and made by the maker of all beside. Although I'm so poor, I have nothing to lose. Still I'm so little I can't be lost. I journey about wherever I choose, and those who carry me bear the cost. The most forgiving of earthly things, I often cling to my deadly foe. In spite of the cruelest flirts and flings, arise by the force that has cast me low. When beauty has trodden me underfoot, I've quietly risen her face to seek, embraced her forehead, or calmly put myself to rest in her dimpled cheek. I've ridden to war on the soldier's plume, but startled and sprung at the wild affray, the sights of horror, of fire and fume, and fled on the wings of the winds away. I've visited courts and been ushered in by the proudest guest of the stately scene, 
I've touched his majesty's bosom pin and the nuptial ring of his lofty queen. At the royal board, in the grand parade, I've oft been one familiar and free. The fairest lady has smiled and laid her delicate gloveless hand on me. Philosopher, poet, and learned, the sage, never declines a call from me, and all of every rank and age admit me into their coterie. I visit the lions of everywhere, if human or brute, and can testify to what they do, to what they wear, to wonders none ever beheld but I. And now, reviewing the things I have done, forgetting my name, my rank, and birth, I begin to think I am number one of the great and manifold things of earth. I've still much more, and I yet might tell, which modesty bids me here withhold. For fear with my travels I seem to swell, grow, for an atom of dust too bold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.